Hello and welcome to your pre-pump education class. When you have diabetes and need to take insulin every day, an insulin pump is a great tool to help you manage your insulin and blood sugar levels. Today, we'll discuss topics to help you prepare for starting on pump therapy, including basics of diabetes, balancing glucose and insulin, balancing carbohydrates and insulin, intensive insulin therapy, and the basics of insulin pump therapy. Learning these concepts can help you better manage your glucose levels and be successful with starting on insulin pump therapy. Let's start by covering the basics of diabetes. For better options to treat diabetes, it helps to learn what it is and how the body works. Diabetes is a condition in the body where blood sugar levels are higher than normal. This can happen when the body doesn't make any insulin, such as type 1 diabetes, or the insulin that the body makes doesn't work well, such as type 2 diabetes. Glucose is the body's fuel. Just like cars need fuel to run, the body needs glucose to work. The body is made up of cells and every cell needs energy. Your body uses glucose, or sugar, for energy. So you need some glucose in your body at all times. So how does the body get glucose for energy? When you eat, food travels into the stomach and digestive system. Food is broken down into nutrients, one of which is glucose. Glucose gets absorbed into the bloodstream and then moves into the fluid that surrounds your tissues and cells. Next, glucose moves into your cells with the help of a hormone called insulin. Insulin is the key that moves glucose inside your cell so your body has energy to live. Insulin, a hormone made by the pancreas, helps lower blood glucose levels by allowing glucose to move out of the blood and into your body's cells. The pancreas releases insulin 24 hours a day and the insulin is released in two ways. A small amount, basal level of insulin, is released between your meals and while you sleep. A larger amount, a bolus, of insulin is released after eating. When you have diabetes, you may not make any insulin or may not make enough insulin, so you rely on taking insulin to lower your glucose levels. Extra glucose that is not needed for energy right away is stored in the liver. Just like a car stores extra gas in its tank, the body stores extra fuel in the liver. The liver releases glucose back into the bloodstream for energy. This happens during sleep and exercise. The pancreas makes another hormone called glucagon. You can think of glucagon as the opposite of insulin because it raises glucose levels. Glucagon signals the liver to release stored glucose back into the bloodstream to help glucose levels rise. The pancreas makes insulin and glucagon to help balance your blood glucose. Next, we'll discuss balancing glucose and insulin. A goal in managing diabetes is to take the right amount of insulin to balance the amount of glucose in your body and to try to avoid high and low glucose levels. This can be difficult to do sometimes, but keeping your blood glucose in target range will help you feel your best. Your healthcare professional will help you figure out your ideal glucose target range and a recommended range for people with diabetes is 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Is anyone familiar with time and range? Time and range is defined as a percentage of time or amount of time spent in range as defined as 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. The American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists also have before meal and after meal glucose guidelines. And your healthcare professional will help you decide what is the best glucose range for you. When you have diabetes, it's important to try to avoid high and low glucose levels. 
Highs and lows don't feel very good in the moment and they can lead to complications in the long run. They can damage the small and large blood vessels in your body, the eyes, kidneys, nerves in your feet, heart, and brain. Let's talk about high glucose levels first. For example, when you eat a meal, glucose levels start to rise. If there's not enough insulin in the body, glucose can't move into the cells. In this case, glucose will stay in the blood and fluids surrounding your cells. More insulin is needed to lower glucose levels. Let's talk about managing high glucose levels with diabetes. Symptoms of high glucose levels include frequent urination, increased thirst, blurred vision, fatigue, and headache. Causes can be too little insulin, illness, or infection. It's important to have a treatment plan for high glucose levels. Low glucose levels are the opposite of high glucose levels. When there is more insulin in the body than is needed and there is not enough sugar available, glucose levels will drop. It's important to drink or eat sugar to make blood glucose levels go back up to a safe range. If your glucose is so low that you cannot eat or drink sugar, someone can give you glucagon. Remember, glucagon makes the liver release glucose into the blood and glucose levels will rise as a result. We'll also discuss managing low glucose levels with diabetes. Symptoms of mild hypoglycemia, numbers below 70 milligrams per deciliter, may include sweating, shakiness or dizziness, nausea, hunger, or headache. Symptoms of moderate hypoglycemia, glucose values between 54 to 69 milligrams per deciliter, may include difficulty concentrating, blurry vision, weakness, confusion, and changes in mood. Causes may include too much insulin, stacking insulin, a decrease or delay in food intake, or an increase in exercise. Just like high glucose levels, it's important to have a treatment plan for low glucose levels. Next, we'll cover treating low glucose levels. Generally, for mild hypoglycemia, which is a blood glucose level below 70 milligrams per deciliter, and moderate hypoglycemia, which is a blood glucose level above 54 milligrams per deciliter, the rule of 15 is recommended. The rule of 15 is commonly used as a guidance for treatment and includes the following steps. Check blood glucose, and if levels are below 70, consume 15 grams of a fast-acting carbohydrate. Wait 15 minutes and test blood glucose again. If glucose levels remain below 70 milligrams per deciliter, repeat steps one and two until glucose is within range. Items that contain 15 grams of carbohydrate include three to four glucose tabs, five jelly beans, four ounces of juice or soda, not diet, eight ounces of low fat or non-fat milk, and a tablespoon of sugar or honey. If blood glucose is less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, consider treating with 20 to 30 grams of fast-acting carbohydrate. Severe hypoglycemia is a low blood glucose level that requires assistance from another person to treat. If glucose is so low that you cannot eat or drink fast-acting carbohydrates, someone can give you glucagon to make blood glucose levels rise. Another important part of managing diabetes is balancing carbohydrates and insulin. But what are carbohydrates? Food contains three main nutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrate, or carbs. When carbs are digested, they get broken down into glucose or sugar, which enters the bloodstream and makes blood glucose levels or blood sugar levels go up. Insulin helps glucose move from the bloodstream into the cells where it can be used for energy. Now, does this mean that because carbohydrates will make your blood sugars level rise that they're bad for you? No. Carbohydrates should be a part of your daily intake. Choose healthy sources of carbohydrates like vegetables, whole grains, beans, and fruits. To count carbohydrates, you must first know what foods contain carbohydrates. Starches, 
such as breads, cereals, crackers, rice, beans or legumes, grains and pasta, soy products like tofu, and starchy vegetables like potatoes, peas, and corn are mostly carbohydrate. Fruits and fruit juices, as well as milk and yogurt, also contain carbs. Of course, sweets and desserts have carbs, including things like candy, cookies, cakes, pastries, and ice cream, puddings, honey, table sugar, syrup, jelly, regular soda, and sports drinks. Carbohydrate counting, or carb counting for short, is one approach to meal planning. If you have diabetes, you may have been asked to count your carbs to help you manage your glucose levels after meals. If you take insulin, carb counting can be a great way to help you figure out how much insulin to take for the food that you're eating. What is carb counting? Carb counting is adding up the grams of carbs that you want to eat so that you can give the right amount of insulin for the food that you eat. Why count carbs? To match your insulin to the food that you eat to better manage glucose levels to help avoid highs and lows. Carbohydrate counting gives you more flexibility and helps your glucose levels stay in balance. The amount of insulin needed by the body will vary depending on the amount of carbohydrate you eat. If you eat more carbohydrate, they make more glucose, which means you will need more insulin. If you eat less carbohydrates, they make less glucose and you'll need less insulin. Your healthcare professional will help you figure out your insulin dose relative to how many carbs you eat. This is called your carb ratio. You can learn more by attending a Medtronic carb counting webinar. If you're interested, I can provide you with more information. Now let's talk about some of the basics of insulin pump therapy. Remember, basal insulin is released by the pancreas in small amounts between meals and during sleep. The pump automatically releases rapid acting insulin every few minutes, 24 hours a day. This is the basal rate, which you can think of as background insulin delivery. The pump's basal insulin delivery is meant to match the liver's steady release of glucose between meals and while you sleep. The pump can be customized with a single basal rate or it can be set with different basal rates during the day or night to better match your body's needs. Basal rates can be adjusted as needed for things such as exercise and activity. Earlier, we also covered that the pancreas releases larger amounts of insulin called bolus insulin. With diabetes, Bolus insulin is a larger dose of insulin you give when eating food or any time that you have a high blood glucose value. Bolus insulin is meant to match the rise in blood glucose levels from eating food. Being able to deliver a bolus through an insulin pump when eating or for a high glucose level offers flexibility. There are different types of insulins available, each type working a little differently. The way these insulins are used together and delivered are called insulin regimens. One main insulin regimen is intensive insulin therapy, which includes multiple daily injections and insulin pump therapy. Let's take a closer look at both of these therapy options. Multiple daily injections is also referred to as MDI, and it includes long-acting basal insulin in combination with a rapid-acting bolus insulin. MDI often includes four to six injections per day of long-acting and rapid-acting insulin. With MDI, long-acting basal insulin is a fixed dose, and it cannot be quickly adjusted for exercise or activities that require more or less basal insulin. This may make avoiding highs and lows difficult at times. With MDI, you are responsible for calculating food boluses based on the amount of food or carbohydrates being eaten and the current blood glucose value. Insulin can be continuously administered through insulin pump therapy, which uses only rapid acting insulin. No long acting insulin is needed when using an insulin pump. The pump is programmed to give a small amount of basal insulin continuously throughout the day and night 
which closely mimics the action of a healthy pancreas. The pump calculates bolus doses based on blood glucose and carbohydrates entered. Insulin pump therapy allows for flexibility in the timing and frequency of meals and snacks. This is similar to MDI, however, can be done without the frequent injections. Insulin can be easily adjusted for changes in insulin needs, such as around exercise, schedule changes, and illness. When taking multiple daily injections, a person needs both long-acting insulin and rapid-acting insulin. As we discussed in the previous slide, when using a pump, only rapid-acting insulin is needed. A disadvantage of using long-acting insulin is that a large volume of that insulin is often injected at one time. This can lead to insulin pooling under the skin and less consistent absorption day to day. The advantage of using rapid-acting insulin is that the smaller amounts of insulin are delivered, so the body has more consistent absorption day to day. This helps reduce day-to-day -day variations in insulin absorption that are often seen with injections of long-acting insulin to better manage glucose levels. With long-acting insulin, you cannot take back the insulin once you've injected it. It's there, working in your body, whether you want it or not. This may sometimes contribute to low glucose levels, like during or after exercise. With an insulin pump, you can change the amount of insulin you receive more often. You can also stop delivery of insulin with an insulin pump, which you cannot do with insulin injections. Suspending the pump stops the basal insulin delivery, and stopping a bolus delivery allows you to stop the remaining delivery of a bolus. With multiple daily injections, you may forget your insulin at home. And unfortunately, if you do, you must skip a dose of insulin. This almost certainly leads to high glucose levels. With an insulin pump, you always have your insulin with you to bolus for food or to correct a high blood sugar. Always having your insulin there when you need it may help you avoid highs and better manage your glucose levels. Where and how to wear an insulin pump are commonly asked questions among new pump users. Most individuals find that wearing an insulin pump presents no problems and that it can be worn in a variety of ways. It typically only takes a short amount of time to find what works best for you. Remember, it takes time to adjust to something new and accessories are available that can add to the convenience of wearing, protecting, and concealing your pump. Consider the following ways to wear an insulin pump. Use the clip that comes with your pump and clip it to a waistband or belt. Put the pump into the pocket of your pants, shorts, or skirt. Slide the pump into your bra with the screen facing away from your skin. When people first start wearing an insulin pump, they wonder where to put it when they sleep. Try the following. Clip it to the waistband of your pajama bottoms or on your pajama top. Place it next to you in the bed under your pillow or on a bedside table. When you use an insulin pump, it is important that you check your blood sugar periodically. You'll learn more about a blood glucose monitoring schedule during device training for your insulin pump. In addition, some people on a pump also use a continuous glucose monitor or CGM. This is a sensor that lets a person continuously know their interstitial glucose levels with a new value every five minutes. This is also called the sensor glucose value. The following resources are helpful if you're looking for more information. The American Diabetes Association has information on diabetes management and care. Calorie King is an app and an online website to help you with car counting carbohydrates. And you can always learn more about Medtronic support and check out live and pre-recorded webinars to help support you in your journey with your insulin pump therapy. Whether you choose pump therapy because of its flexibility, convenience, or to help improve your glucose control, it will be a valuable tool in helping to manage your diabetes. Thanks for joining class today.